everybody. This is World of Paleoanthropology, and today we are here with Dr. Augustine Fuentes, and we are very excited. And well, I'm going to turn it over to him and allow him to introduce himself a little bit. Thanks, Seth. Uh, my name is Augustine Fuentes. I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, biological anthropologist, anthropologist interested in the intersections between culture and biology, and someone who's also really interested not just in human primates, but all primates, past and present. Uh, so I think that's a, a context for the kind of um, background I bring and the kinds of questions that I ask, right? I'm really interested in what makes humans tick, but recognizing that to understand what makes humans tick, why do we do what we do? Who are we? We need to understand not only contemporary human populations, human behavior, human biology, but we have to understand past humans and we have to understand uh, a comparative baseline with other primates. So all of those things sort of triangulate together for me to offer insight into why we do what we do. Which I think is a very special insight that you offer because usually we see in the field people uh, specialize like very specifically. So having someone such as yourself who's bringing in all these different fields of anthropology to figure out why we tick, as you say, is something that I think is special and unique to you. And I find it fascinating how you, um, I've read a few of your books. I'm reading your, one of your most current ones now. I keep forgetting the title, but um, Why We Believe. So I'm evolution afraid. and the human way of being yes. <laughs> why we believe evolution and the human way of being I like that title <laughs> yes um so I'm reading that one currently and I'm loving it oh, but fantastic. it definitely explores areas that you traditionally um as far as I go personally I'm more on the biological anthropology side so exploring the more cultural and why our brains function the way they do and how that put evolutionary forces on our biological side of things is definitely something very interesting to me. And I think it's something that a lot of our viewers find interesting as well. So can you speak to how things like culture and things like that influence even our biological build. Absolutely. Um, and but, but before I launch into that, let me even back up to ask, why would we ask such questions, right? Why, why exactly. you know, rather than just looking at, you know, neurobiological pathways or endocrine system function or muscle or bone function, um, why would we ask something like, you know, about cultural perception and processes? So, to, to answer that question and then to get into it to the one you specifically asked, I just want to back up and say, look, part of my training. So one of my undergraduate degrees is in zoology. Um, it was from University of California, Berkeley, when they still had a zoology department, which was a um, <clears throat> um, really focused, uh, connected with the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, really focused on um, natural history. Right. And so what was amazing about that degree was that you spent a lot of time outside the classroom in the classroom was great because you had to know every mammal. you had to really <laughs> drill down and know mammals and birds and reptiles. So you really had to learn all of that. But what was amazing is you also to, to complete the degree degree had to spend a lot of time outside the classroom doing fieldwork, um, but natural history fieldwork where you went out and watched brown towhees or dusky footed wood rats or uh, Western goals or whatever you, you had access to in that kind of context, and just watched and learned and noted down what you were seeing and tried to pick sort of to see the seamless interconnection between an organism's body, an organism's ecology, and an organism's behavior, and try to sort of figure out how all of that is working together. So this old naturalist approach of getting the entire picture, I think is really important. And that fits so well with um, both biological and cultural anthropological and, and the archaeological and linguistic anthropology, but, but specifically biological and cultural anthropological perspectives, where we go out and we, we want to get the whole picture of the human. The problem is we're usually trained in a very specific picture of the human. So I'm going to go in and you know study group X, uh, and I'm going to have them spit to a tube for me, and then I'm going to look at you know, uh, do some salivary endocrinological assessment and then sort of relate that to broader things. That's important. And those are really good data. 
but we have to remember that, you know, your spit is part of your body, which is part of your, you know, and digestive system and brain and culture and history. And so trying to get the sort of natural history of humans, is where, what I'm all leading up to here, is really important, right? So, so if we think about the natural history of humans, if we think about what we need to understand about humans, then we need to recognize as many scholars have pointed out, uh, Tim Engel does a really good job of this. Um, the neuroanthropologists Greg Downey and Daniel Lendier just really, really do a good job of explaining this. Uh, so does the medical anthropologist Margaret Locke. We need to think about not biology as the material and cultural as the sort of stuff that floats around or that we perceive, but actually think of the two in constant interconnection and dialogue as they mutually shape one another. So, you know, for example, as we develop, right, uh, uh, you know, one of those amazing things uh, biologically about humans is this incredible period of development, this really long extended childhood phase. That extended developmental process is a time in which what you eat, who you meet, what sounds you hear, what languages you engage with, you know, what experiences you have, what physical sort of interactions you have with others, what kind of other animals, other species you engage with, all of that has deep biological structuring effects on your system as you develop, right? Not just in the sense of building neurobiologies, but in the sense of your immune system, uh, in the sense of your visual acuity, in the sense of sort of modeling perception of taste buds, not just the chemical reaction of taste buds, but how you perceive that chemical reaction in which language you speak, which shapes then a whole bunch of the ways in which you interact with the world, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the bottom line is that everything's complicated on the planet, right? That there's very few simple organisms but humans are particularly complicated. And so to do a good anthropology, which is really natural history of the human, um, you, you gotta sort of be ready to integrate all of that. That's why, and I'll shut up after this very long uh, soliloquy here. <laughs> that's why in the contemporary landscape, given what we know about humans, really good research requires teamwork and collaboration by a number of different disciplines or a number of different specialists within anthropology. The best data are those data that emerge from these sort of complex collaborations because it's just a pretty much too complicated for that old thing of like what I did in my dissertation research where you go out by yourself to some remote area and collect data. <laughs> I mean, great, it taught me a lot, but really in, in comparison to contemporary team-based dissertation projects, mine was horrible, absolutely atrocious <laughs> relative to the quality of data and the real sort of impact that you could make. Right, right. Now you bring up a good point. Um, so there's an ongoing debate, as I'm sure you know, in the anthropological and scientific community in general versus open access versus um, you know paid access. Where do you stand, and what do you think? How do you think it affects the community? So I mean, knowledge about us by us, I mean humans, right? Uh, that's pretty important and should not be restricted, right? I, I think information is really important. However, knowledge in the academic landscape, knowledge is a currency, right? And so people's careers and lives and jobs and livelihoods are sort of dependent on their ability to, to sort of gain knowledge, construct, analyze, and then disseminate that knowledge, right? So how, how do we do that best? And, and I think this idea of open access in the ideal world, I mean, all results, all analyses should eventually be accessible to all, um, even mm -hmm. outside the academy. Um, but I do understand this need um, to have some system of engagement of structure that allows people to get credit for the work they do, right? Um, and to have that be assessed in, in, in formal ways. I think journals should be moving more and more towards open access. There's the financial issue, but I think that is on the journals, um, not on, on the scholars. <laughs> if you're lucky enough like me to be an elite institution with you know, substantial grant funding and all of that, um, you know, on average, I could pay, right? Even though these, not all, like what is it in nature? It's like $6,000 to have an open access or somewhere. Anyway, um, yeah, I just turned down an open, I should have uh, uh, done open access, but it was like $4,000 and I didn't do it. And I regret that, but $4,000 is a lot of money. And, you know, maybe right. I should be spending that money on helping a student complete a project rather than a paying a journal uh, for allowing people to read what I wrote. Um, so it, it's complicated, though, because 
Dissemination requires infrastructure, right? And the journal system has a particular infrastructure that is connected to uh, largely, but not exclusively, a, a, a sort of neoliberal capitalist enterprise. Um, and so <laughs> these journals are trying to make money off of our labor. Um, so, so it's complicated. You know, in a philosophical sense, I think everything should be open access. In a practical sense, we need to figure out systems, delays, structures, context, which enables the maximum access to knowledge and information, but doesn't take away from the value that the sort of ownership, manipulation, dissemination of that knowledge is for the academy. That is a great answer. And, you know, I, you know, my whole thing as a student is open access, just mm -hmm. because I don't, you know, have necessarily the funds to procure certain things that someone who's been in the career for a while does. But I fully understand where, you know, it is a trade, as you said, yeah. and you there it's a currency. And that is important. And to disseminate that is going to take a long time and a lot of work. Um, but one thing that I think is great that people such as yourself have done is that writing books and, you know, it's, I know obviously the publisher makes money, you make money, et cetera. But putting that information out there, but putting that information out there, you're still providing it in a way that's accessible to really anyone. Yeah. And that's a great thing. Uh, you know, I, I can't agree more. And it's a luxury and a privilege to to have the opportunity to write books. Um, it, it's funny about, you know, I actually have made, I'm gonna say make money, but it's not a lot, but I've made a little bit, like I've gotten royalty checks, right? From some of my mm. books, right? I've published, you know, something like 20, you know, five or six single authored books and, you know, 14 or 15 edited volumes. A few of those have paid off in royalty checks. Most don't. So I think that's an important <laughs> thing for people to recognize is that most of the time, academic books do not provide royalties or support. Sometimes they do. Um, Trade books, on the other hand, um, do do provide royalties, um, and especially if you negotiate well up front, you can get something for that. Having said that, not everyone is in the luxury and the position to write books, nor should everyone be writing books, right? Some people, right. you know, are really interested in this and and are have the time and the space to do it. Um, but I think it should be encouraged as a skill set. I think, and not just books, blogs, vlogs, the whole sort of public dissemination of knowledge, I think, should be encouraged as a normative skill set within graduate and undergraduate training, particularly in PhD programs. I mean, we should be really thinking about training people not just to be scientists, right, but to be science educators or to at least be somewhat knowledgeable with mechani the mechanisms of translation from the academy to the public. Why is that? Because our knowledge is valuable and it really matters. But if it stays in the academy, it doesn't do anything, right? It does stuff for us. Right. But really, right. we all, I'm pretty sure almost everyone got into it because they wanted to do something and doing something means interfacing with the public. So that's a very long answer again, but I really enjoy <laughs> writing books because um, especially the more popular books, because people will read them, or at least I hope people will read them. Um, and, and that's a way outside of the classroom and outside of the peer reviewed academic literature to say, hey, look, we don't own this knowledge. This knowledge is for everyone. And especially in a landscape with so much misinformation and so much bias uh, and harmful information, misinformation about what it means to be human, uh, especially about things like human difference uh, and human similarities and human ancestries. Um, I think it's, it's important for those of us who can, who have the luxury to do so, to try to, to be as public facing as possible. I definitely agree with that. And now moving to more of physical anthropological questions, just cause that's, as I said, where I focus. Um, I just wanna pick your brain a little bit. Pick away, but, but let's call it biological anthropology. The name okay. of the association will change soon. and. And I have, a, I have a bone to pick with the term physical. So let's stick with biology. Okay, so we'll st that, is more, that is actually what my degree will be in. So that is more than, <laughs> that is more than okay. Um, 
So let's start with Homo naledi. You, as you do with Homo sapiens and as you've done with other species, as we've talked about, have discussed culture and its role and how it affects right. actions and evolution. What are your thoughts on why there's so many individuals down in that cave? And do you think it was a cultural aspect or do you think it was a crazy act of nature? Like, what do you think? I think the preponderance of evidence strongly supports, if you want to call it culture, if you want to call it tradition, if you want to call it social complexity, whatever. Um, but let's just use culture for shorthand. Uh, I think the preponderance of evidence suggests that Homo naledi was participating in a kind of community-based or sort of communal uh, behavior around the dead. Um, I, I, don't, I, I really think that's, I think we need to provide good evidence that that's not the case. I think that, that seems to me to be a, a pretty, pretty easy answer. Why? Um, because given, you know, by the mid Pleistocene, all populations of the genus Homo were doing a diverse array of easily definable as cultural uh, behavior. Um, and I think much older than that, we're also seeing things that everyone would agree is culture. And really, come on, I mean, we can argue that pretty much all the hominoids engage in cultural behavior, as do many other really interesting complex social mammals. Let's take orcas, for example, or, you know, a variety of different cetaceans, or, and then and, and porpoises and dolphin, who are cetaceans, but you know what I mean, um, and other things. So given the current layout of, of the Naledi discoveries, the context in which they've been found, and the sort of minimal but suggestive reconstructions that have been able to be conducted, um, it seems to me it's one is very hard pressed to explain this in some other way than living group members taking their dead group members and sort of intentionally depositing them in a place. Um, now, what did that actually mean to them? We can't know that, right? But that it probably meant something, I think is, is most likely a true statement. So, so that I think is fascinating. And we have other evidence of, of you know, uh, treatment of the dead in particular ways, the, you know, the, the stuff from Simi de los Huesos and Atapuerca. Mm -hmm. um, and then especially in the last couple hundred thousand years, I think we've got some pretty good evidence um, for, for some post-mortem uh, engagement um, plus a whole bunch of other stuff that is cultural. It's just that, you know, people are like, Naledi has a small brain. Obviously they can't be cultural. And, and we just know that's, that's not true from the study of other organisms. So, so right, that, that argument right. is off the table. That's off the table. Um, and everyone still wants, you know, even though now everyone's on the bandwagon of yes, it's not just contemporary homo sapiens that do culture and do nifty stuff with art and ochre and stuff like that. Even though everyone has to admit that because the data require them to, the data are there people still don't want to let go of that. Oh, well, we had to be better than other forms of homo. That's why we're here and they're not. Mm -hmm. So if, so I've read multiple books, even titled something like this. And I asked this question because of the last sentence you said, why are we the last ones left? So I think the we there is the real problem. Right. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, we have basically called everything that is there's this anatomical modernity. So Mark Kissel and I have a paper just out in evolutionary anthropology, basically arguing again, as many others have argued, look, let's just stop using the term modern human. That's that's a bad term. It actually doesn't make much sense. And in, in nature, um, uh, there's a big paper recently uh, uh, from Eleanor Sari and her group. Um, really reifying and, and, and really pushing the same, very same concept that it's quite diverse. So if mid to late Pleistocene Homo was characterized by a whole bunch of different populations, many of whom clearly exchanged genetic information and probably exchanged cultural material and behavioral information as well, um, are the we that we're talking about them too? So, so hear, hear me out. I think, and I think there's very good evidence and a number of people have, have you know, uh, 
uh, Becky Ackerman, uh, Leonard Scarry's work, um, a number of other folks have clearly demonstrated that contemporary humans, right, are a composite, right, that our evolutionary history involves multiple other populations of genus Homo in the sort of mid to terminal Pleistocene uh, mixing with the population that is currently Homo sapiens. So if that's the case, you know, is it accurate to say we are the only ones left standing, or is it more accurate to say we are Homo sapiens of 2021? What did Homo sapiens of 100,000 years ago look like? It, could it be that there were multiple populations that fit within that species, but that were much more diverse than contemporary differences in, in, in humanity? I think that's very possible. So mm -hmm. sorry not to have a better answer, right? We didn't outcompete <laughs> anything. I don't think we outcompeted anything. We are the contemporary version of this incredible lineage, genus Homo, that has been diverse for a long time and actually underwent a reduction in diversity uh, in sort of morphology for the contemporary reality. But I would say our diversity has expanded culturally. So, Assuming that we survive the challenges of climate change, do you see us ever biologically devolving again? <laughs> I mean, so, you know, evolution is ongoing all the time, right? It's just the processes of evolution for contemporary humans are very dynamic, right? We've got selection acting at multiple levels. Uh, we've got cultural evolutionary processes ongoing. We've got really, really interesting sort of um, modes of different kinds of inheritance, cultural inheritance, obviously genetic inheritances, but epigenetic processes and patterns. And then this whole perceptual and inheritance of belief which impacts mating, right? Which impacts overall health, which impacts sort of uh, geographic movement and, and aggression and conflict within and between societies. So all of that is sort of ongoing right now. So what are we gonna look like in the future? I mean, we're gonna look a lot like we do now, right? But our distribution across the planet will be a little bit more different. Um, you know, the pattern and distribution of body shape and skin color and hair type is gonna move around as it is doing now. Um, but I, you know, I don't think, I, you know, we've been a couple hundred thousand years with the sort of the general morphotype that we're talking about right now, maybe 300,000 years, 200,000, what have you. I think that's, that's not going to change that much. I think a lot of other physiological and endocrine systems might be undergoing change. Um, I have no idea what this living in two dimensions on Zoom is doing to our hypothalamus right now. So, <laughs> you know, downstream, uh, that might change. But, but no, the external morphology, the sort of generalized morphology, I think that's here for a while. Okay, that's a good answer. And very, um, you know, I mean, I don't know what we would turn into, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, think about the, the limited options. I mean... You know, it, yeah. we're always this the the science fiction and many academic sort of uh, uh, predictors are always saying, "Well, we're going to evolve this way or that way." Actually, for a long time, what we do, at least with the basic frame, the basic morphology that we have, it's been fairly consistent um, for a pretty long time. And so, I think it's not so much about morphology anymore. Morphology matters, but 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 we have a lot real flexible morphology, right? I mean, humans range by 100% in height and more than that in weight across populations, right? So right. we're already like one of the most variable extant mammals out there. So, you know, for us, I don't think we're gonna get more variable, uh, but I don't think we're gonna get less variable, but I don't think we're gonna sort of section off and, and like, you know, modify the external morphology dramatically. Okay. Now, so you mentioned that you, had just or you were about to just publish a paper mm -hmm. um so what are you working on right now well actually <laughs> that's a good question a lot of stuff so the paper that we just published which is actually irrelevant to this exact discussion uh mark kissel at appalachia state and i have been collaborating off and on uh for a number of years really fun collaboration and mark is a, just a fantastic amazing scholar and teacher um and really fun to, to write with um, we just published an evolutionary anthropology, uh, a critique 
uh, data-based and theoretical critique of, of the concept of modern humans. So hopefully people will look at that. And that's an ongoing project. So we're still thinking about that. Um, I've been working on this sort of this notion of belief, right, as an evolutionary mm -hmm. process, sort of thinking of cultural niche construction and cultural evolution as it relates to sort of part of human evolutionary processes, uh, not instead of, but actually part of. Uh, and, and I'm developing a big project right now to look at um, the evolution, uh, evolutionary impact of concepts and conceptual thought. How do sort of shared strong ideologies or perceptions change the way in which humans see, feel, and act in the world? And how might, might that have evolutionary impacts, right? So had a particular concept. So, you know, something about like, you know, what is to have a, having a tool is not just about having a tool, using a tool or making a stone into a tool. It's actually the concept of the tool that facilitates a lot of these interactions and what have you. Um, other patterns, you know, conceptual patterns, like when you're training, like what kind of concepts do individuals need to, to be better athletes or to be better, right? How, how does that shift in ideology and perception actually change how your body works? So I'm interested in that. I have, that is a project ongoing. Um, and then, uh, you know, I have a long interest in race and racism. And so I have right. uh, been continuing work on contemporary human variation and misrepresentation of that variation. Um, and I'm particularly interested now working with some colleagues in medical schools, sort of thinking about how doctors are trained uh, and, and oh. what, what that, what do we, how does that play out in, in, in terms of broader health? And finally, because we're in the middle of a pandemic, uh, you know, I've had to cut off some research or put it off. So for the last eight or nine months, I've been doing some pandemic research as well. Oh, well, you are definitely a very busy man. Um, we, I said I'm interested in why humans do what they do. And the thing is, we do all sorts of really complicated, fascinating stuff. And what I've always found, and I, well, not always found, because at first I didn't recognize it, but over, I've been doing this for 30 years or so. Um, what I find more and more is that stuff is connected. Um, and mm -hmm. so not studying a couple different parts of those connections uh, makes it easier to miss the big picture. And I'm really interested in the big picture. That's great. And you're... The way you're talking is very um, inspiring, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, you're making me think a lot. But as far as, you know, I remember when I was reading The Creative Spark that you said something along the lines of, and this is gonna be completely misquoted because I read this a few years ago. Um, if I can even remember what it was, it was something along the lines of like how imagination fueled human evolution. And even I, before reading your book, surprisingly wrote a blog post on the exact same thing. And I found we had similar ideas and, you know, just, why don't you talk about that a little? Because in my opinion, I don't see how it doesn't affect human evolution. Totally agree. Um, and so here, I mean, a lot of people written on this, but you know who who I really draw on from this is uh, our, you know, biological, one of the great grandfathers of biological anthropology, Ashley Montague, um, who writes about this in a number of popular books uh, about human evolution. It's really impressive. Um, so I paraphrase him and, and many others when I say that for me, one of the most remarkable ability about humans, past and present, right, is the ability to look at the world, to see how it is, to see the material reality of the world, to imagine new possibilities and to at least try to make them real, right? I think that's actually, if you had to pitch what is the human story, that is the human story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so this capacity for imagination, right? This capacity for detached mental representation, this ability, right, to form novel scenarios, images, or possibilities in the mind in collaboration with others almost always um, is really important. I'm not saying other organisms can't do it, but they can't do it as well as humans do, or they can't communicate it to others as well. I, I, am, I fully 
I'm convinced that I have seen in the wild working with other primates, primates have a great idea and just not be able to communicate to the other primates. So, yeah, I've seen this in macaques, I think I've seen this in chimps, I've seen, I've seen this in, in orangutans. Um, the frustration of not being able to communicate it effectively in humans, I, although we can lie and do all sorts of other stuff, humans have the capacity, even pre-linguistic humans, to convey a dense, complex imaginary to others in ways that nothing else can. Right, and I think it's, you know, it's all about the, our ability to believe mm -hmm. in the abstract. What's not, yeah. as you said, what's not there in front of us. We're able to right. plan but we can't out. even, right, this whole, this, and I talk about that and why we believe. I mean, the experience of the transcendent, right? The, the certainty that there's more than this here right now right that that's ubiquitous across all humans and i think that's actually fairly old and i think that translates into this capacity for stuff like hope like why did why did earlier members of genus homo right mid even you know uh mid pleistocene well, man even a you know million years ago or more go out on journeys or move into new landscapes that were clearly not a good idea right really <laughs> not you know, and then more recently, what are people doing moving really far north? I mean, you know, I'm looking outside, there's a snowstorm going on right now. This is insane. Um, and yet, and yet we've done this repeatedly over great amounts of time in history and done it effectively sometimes, right? I'm sure many more early human populations went extinct than made it. But to do that, you need hope. You need an imagination. You need the capacity to convince yourself and your whole group that we can do this some way or another. That's really powerful. So if you had to explain, and I know this is going to be a hard question, but where did it come from? Hmm. Like, where did hope come from? <laughs> so, I mean, I, I both in the Creative Spark and in Why We Believe, I, I try to lay on the table what I think are some valid hypotheses for or, and scenarios, right? Uh, hypothetical scenarios for how this might emerge. Um, I think it, again, like everything, it's complicated, right? And it's a constellation mm -hmm. of events, right? It is sort of this primate capacity and, and incredible investment in social connectivity, cooperation, collaboration, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this, this incredible social, this ability to join together, to challenge, to solve problems, to do things like that. Um, I think it's also this ability um, that emerged out of necessity to manipulate stone or wood or bone or each other in ways to solve problems, but that, that the capacity to do that seems to have ratcheted up, right, over the last couple million years from just a sort of necessity-based manipulation of items to a creative uh, manipulation of items to the creation of wholly new items, right? And I think that has to do with, as I said before, sort of the, the you know, we inherited these great primate hands, this great primate overlapping 3D uh, vision, this incredible primate social cognition, all of that comes together bef well before the appearance of our lineage into sort of very complex creative processes. But then you start with the lineage homo and you slow down that early development. You provide all this time for the acquisition of, of knowledge outside the womb, for brain growth outside the womb. You require an intense amount of caretaking of the young, which involves an incredible kind of connectivity and cooperation between the group. I could go on and on. But what I'm saying is the human niche, this is a particular niche that's distinctive relative to other organisms. And that niche provides affordances, it provides possibilities for new evolutionary processes and patterns to emerge. And from that comes this capacity for imagination and hope. So it's not like a single adaptation or a trait, right? Hope mm -hmm. is not a trait, imagination is not a trait. It's a process that is part of this human niche that evolved uh, particularly over um, the uh, terminal Pleistocene. Okay. And that is, you know, very, I find it utterly fascinating, all of this. And I know my viewers do as well. <laughs> um, if you had to, I usually ask this, so just for fun. If you had to pick your favorite hominid or hominin, what would it be? Oh. Well, I, there's probably a whole bunch, but 
right at this moment, it's because I recently uh, spent a good amount of time with uh, uh, Rebecca Sykes' uh, recent book, Kindred. Oh, okay. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful anthropology of the Neanderthal peoples. Right. Um, and it's just amazing and just really incredible. And so I'm going to cheat here and say that my all-time favorite hominin is Homo sapiens writ large. Okay, because I'm going to say Homo sapiens for me pretty much captures a majority of Homo populations over the last 300,000 years. Um, I really am not a, a splitter when it comes to the species level distinctions. I think we probably, there might be argument for subspecies, um, sort of different biological lineages, but, but I think Homo sapiens is really incredible. Um, and I think we're still incredible, right? Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned about that connectivity. But of course, you know, I have other hominins that I, I just think are just, you know, spectacular and fantastic. I, I want, I, I would love to go back, love to go back, back to the Pliocene and, and see what something like Sahelanthropus or Aurorin are. I, I just want to see what they are. I don't know what they are. I'm, I'm not 100% <laughs> convinced. Uh, they're hominins. They probably are, but I, I just want to see what they look like and how they live. I want to spend a day hanging out with Sahelanthropus and see what it is. And then, you know, everyone should want to spend a day with uh, uh, Australopithecus afarensis, just just right. just to hang out, right? You know, uh, I want to hang out with the family from AL three 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 before whatever horrible happened to them happened to them. Yeah. Right? I want to know yeah. what was going on. What was that day like? And of course, recently, I mean, you know, Homo naledi. I mean, what? Right. How did they start going into that cave and why? <laughs> I just want to know. So, you know, I, I love all of our lineage. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think Homo sapiens are just so complicated and fascinating that uh, I'll put them at the top of the list. So in that thinking, do you stick with the traditional idea of a species definition where if they can interbreed they're the same species or uh, you know so we we all know and anyone who thinks evolutionarily um across time um that we don't have um, an accurate species definition right um okay. and species are arbitrary distinctions between uh temporally uh temporal slices of evolutionary time so i mean i was part of this i got to you know, uh, participate in some great symposium species. There was this great book that came out in the 90s that was all the top theorists on species. And, you know, the, the bottom, the, the end result is, you know, find one definition you like and stick with it. <laughs> um, but, you know, our paleo species definitions are horrible. They're, they're, they're not very good, but they serve us because we need to classify and categorize things. So we use morpho species examples. It'd be better to use some sort of ecological species example, maybe. But I think biological species we know in the contemporary world is fuzzy, right? Um, right? Many things that we call different species don't see each other as different species. You know, if anyone who's worked with macaques in Southeast Asia knows right away that our whole uptightness about species definitions is not shared <laughs> by the species we classify. So, you know, and, and in species in the contemporary conservation landscape the whole concept of species has become a very important political tool. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a traditionalist, but I do recognize the, important of the, and the, the importance of and the need for species categorizations. I just think people need to back off and not get all freaked out as, you know, it's Neanderthal different species from humans. I, I don't think so. Um, and you right. can't prove it one way or another. So, you know, scientifically speaking, we don't, we can't know, right? But what we can do is describe how, how do these different populations live? You know, are there really clear divergences? Are there overlaps? Um, what, what do their biological signatures, processes and patterns look like? Are there divergences or overlaps? That's the much more interesting. The, the actual biological questions and evolutionary questions are interesting. What we call them actually is the least important of the whole thing. Now, you say we can't know, and you know, it could be coming from left field here, but don't we have, say, like the Neanderthal genome and can see differences? And I know recently, 
I saw an art, I read an article where they you spliced like some Neanderthal gene or um, genes into a human brain and or a, their brain, their brain organelles. It's not, it's a whole other, okay. um, it's really yeah. cool. I mean, I don't know if it's cool. It's sci-fi e cool, like from the geek, sci-fi geek, tech geek in me loves it. Um, but <laughs> is it what they're saying? It's a much more complicated thing. But, but right. here, so here's, here's the point. Yes, we have. Uh, now a growing number of Neanderthal sequences. We've got some Denisovan sequences, got a, a lot of different kinds of ADNA. We also have a lot of contemporary human uh, sequences. So yeah, we can say, look, Neanderthal sequences look demonstrably different than contemporary human sequences. But how different are those Neanderthal sequences? And, and in which ways do they differ from all of their contemporary genus homo population mm. sequences? Okay. That's the question. We're, to compare something from 200,000 years ago to a contemporary, it, you're going to expect all sorts of differences. And we know that we share many of those sequences. People say we have Neanderthal DNA. I mean, so what we know is that different populations of genus homo that we call different things were clearly exchanging genetic material. So, you know, what, why, are, why are we worried about species designations when we should be worried about what does the landscape of genomic diversity look like at 200,000 years, at 100,000 years relative to today? And we know there's some really important differences, right? But if we're going to ask about our Neanderthals, different species, then contemporary populations that we share more genetically in common with at the, you know, at the same time as Neanderthals, that's the real question. And, you know, I, I had never actually thought about it that way, you know, comparing a sequence from 200,000 years ago to contemporary humans. Obviously, there are going to be differences that just evolved and happened and whatnot. Um, and you would have to compare them to Homo sapiens at the time that's right. equal. And, and, and we know there's a whole bunch of different populations. We have some evidence from some of them, but we also know from contemporary genomes that there's a bunch of what we call ghost population, which is a horrible term, but it's basically we know there was other populations that were demonstrably distinct, but have contributed to the genome, but we have no idea what their morphology is or cultural patterns or whatever. So we know that there's a bunch of diversity out there, let's say at 200,000 years ago, what we don't know is how that diversity maps in its entirety to contemporary human diversity, right? And so those are the two, right? That, so yes, Neanderthals are different in many ways, actually. There's some interesting morphological differences, some other differences on average, but Neanderthal peoples, right? Neanderthals weren't a solid thing. Neanderthal peoples were spread across a huge swath of Eurasia, right? And this latest publication, um, although some people are doubting it, you know, puts them close into the African continent. And I have no right. doubt that things right. that we would call Neanderthal did live uh, in, in that region or moved back and forth uh, because we got to take things, you know, if we're talking about something 200,000 years ago, we need to think of the landscape of the genus Homo 200,000 years ago, not that thing versus us and that other thing over there versus us. That's the wrong comparison. Right, right. And that makes perfect sense. Um, and, you know, as we wrap up here, is there anything you would just like to say or speak on? I mean, thank you for doing this kind of podcast and for sort of inviting folks to talk about these things. What I'm really excited about now is looking at, at, at you, right? Looking at the younger generation of scholars um, who are fearless about melding sort of hardcore really good high quality scientific engagement, lab work, field work, methodology and theory with outward facing sort of intellectual and even risky exchanges of like, here's ideas, here's what's going on. There's, it's an exciting time. And so I, I think people need to keep that up, but we have to be very careful not to let the past, not to let the conservatism of the academy and the conservatism of society restrict people from the kinds of questions they want to ask or restrict biological anthropology, since we're talking about that in general, from being as diverse, inclusive, and interesting as it can be. And I think, I think we need to still push against a, a very conservative academy and a very conservative sort of society that wants to restrict access and to restrict imagination when thinking about the past and the present of humanity. And I think we, right, sort of this sort of 
biological evolutionary anthropologists, we actually hold a lot of the keys and we hold a lot of responsibility to help people imagine sort of more interesting pasts, uh, a much more understanding, a deeper understanding of the present and, and really to offer something in thinking about what, what the future might look like. And that is a beautiful way to close. So I'm going to hit stop recording now.